we, we, we meet once more again. We continue with our motor connection uh, circuits. The last time, the one we did, we did, we started off with the one rotor induction motor, and there we saw the compact starter, which I'm going to refer to here, used also in starting our synchronous induction motor. Now, as you know, our induction motors, they don't run at the synchronous speed. They run at a slip, so that there is the cutting of the rotor uh, conductors by the rotating magnetic field. In the case of the synchronous motors, when they are running at full speed, they run at the synchronous speed. So there is no cutting of the rotor windings by the rotating magnetic fields. And for them to be able to do that one, they normally the rotor windings become uh, magnetized, the same number of poles as the stator poles, and then they lock and then they move together. Now, the last time also when we left, I think I mentioned a small, uh, I gave a small uh, exercise for you to do. Well, I think I gave you seven, I gave you, I think there were four sevens, and I wanted you to combine them to make it into 56. And so far, I think I don't, have not yet gotten a, a comment on that one there, but is a shortcut. We can see from these numbers, we can be able to get uh, eight. Oops. Let me get that. We can get it to get uh, eight times seven. I think that one is 56. So maybe that can act as a clue. Now, these bits of bits exercise I'm giving you is to show you how the mind, when you are doing design, operates. You know the answer, in our case was 56, you ask us to work way around to get it. So in most design aspects, we know what we want, we come up with a drawing, or we know what we want, and the purpose is to do the designing bit. If it's a drawing, for example, we want to manufacture a car, or like the circuit I gave you the other time, the shortcut for doing the forward and reverse for the star delta, sometimes which I ask you to do, your mind works in a particular way to get to the solution. And you find when you are doing design work, mostly that's how your mind will be operating, or you train it to operate. And as I said, design can only be done through uh, practice. Now today, we are going to do the three-phase synchronous motor. And as you know, the synchronous motor is not self-starting. Hence, various methods are used. Now, the commonly used ones are whereby you have a prime mover. Now, this one is, in most cases, usually a motor. It's used to start it, to rotate. And then, when synchronous speed is attained, the, problem, the prime mover is disengaged. So, you turn your rotor. Once you reach the synchronous speed, the, rotor, the prime mover is disengaged. By that time, the rotor poles will have locked with the stator winding poles and then they move at the synchronous speed. Now, the other method is for the motor to start as an induction motor and to move into synchronism. And hence the name synchronous induction motor. So our topic here should have been uh, synchronous motor, but I included the induction bit to know that the kind of starting is the motor will start as a, an induction motor and then move into synchronism. And that is a method that is commonly used uh, in industry. So if you have a look at this diagram here, it's a typical example of a circuit connection of a synchronous induction motor. Here, the connection here is to the compact starter. I think we have a drawing of this one here. We know how it's... Uh, connection it's all about. And then the three phases are brought into our stator windings. These are the ones that generate the rotating magnetic field. And then our rotor windings, they are connected externally to slip rings. Now the slip rings, like the induction motor, they're on the same shaft as the rotor windings. And on the same 
shaft where the rotor windings, the slip rings, the mount and exciter is mounted. And then we have the starting resistors as in the wound rotor uh, motor. Since we want to start as an induction motor, the arrangement is more or less similar to the induction motor itself, only with the addition of the exciter. Now we know an exciter is a generator that produces a stable DC current. And this current is usually fed into the rotor windings. We magnetize it in the same number of poles as the stator windings, and then they move together into synchronism. Now here, our variable resistors, as I said before, when we are starting, there must be some resistance in the circuitry, and then you go on reducing it until you reach the run position when the resistor is eliminated. And in this case here, we have got our exciter in the circuit here, so we cannot lift our uh, brushes from the slip rings, since this is the one that will generate the DC current which will produce poles in our rotor windings. So when we want to start, we get it running, and then we adjust our resistors. So this one starts producing the magnetic, rotating magnetic field, which induces a current here. The top generated starts this one to rotate. So it starts off like an induction motor. Now as it starts rotating, we start reducing our resistances here. In this case, we'll be moving, reducing them will be coming downwards. And then, at a particular point of the speed, since the same shaft where the rotor is, is here where exciter is, at a particular preset value, the exciter will start generating a voltage. And as you can see, this exciter is connected in series with one of the resistors. So at a particular preset view, at a preset value, the exciter produces a voltage. And that voltage sends a current in our rotor windings. And the direct current from this exciter magnetizes the rotor with the same number of poles as our stator windings. Consequently, now two forces will be in existence. The, uh, the poles which are generated here, they will kind of be attracted by the poles which are rotating in this field here. And also, the motor running as an induction motor, the exact force being generated, that's usually generated when the motor is running as an induction motor. So, slightly before it reaches the full speed, the rotor here will be subjected to the two forces. The one I said is the same as for the induction motor. The other one is the poles set up by the exciter in the rotor windings. They will also produce an alternating torque. Now, that torque is alternating because this one is rotating. And the poles which are produced here will try to lock up with the poles produced by the stator windings. And the fluctuations caused by the poles set up here will cause your rotor winding to move into the same speed as your rotating magnetic field in the stator windings. So your rotor windings is able to move at synchronous speed. Now for it to be able to move at a synchronous speed, the rotor windings must have the poles in them. Because those poles are the ones which lock with the poles on the stator windings and they move together as one. So now your rotor starts running like a at a synchronous speed, hence the name synchronous induction motor. It starts an induction motor and then the exciter will assist it to move into synchronism. Now we have to maintain those poles for the entire running period of the motor. And by the time when it reaches the run position, the whole of the resistors will be eliminated. And as you can see, this one here will be shorting. That amount to shorting our rotor windings. Same connections like for the uh, induction motor. 
only this time there is a current flowing in these windings here which produce poles and now those rotating poles are locked with the theta winding poles and the two, the rotating magnetic field and the, theta and the rotor windings, they rotate at synchronous speed. Hence, this kind of a motor gets the name of the synchronous induction motor. So, in the, when it continues running, it runs like a synchronous motor. And like before, we can see, in case uh, the motor is loaded so to slow down, then the induction bit comes into place and then it moves back into the synchronous uh, speed. And I think that's all I want to say about the synchronous induction motor. In our next examination, this, you should be able to reproduce it. Normally the theory behind it, we cover it in our circuit analysis. And of course, the same theory in details indicating the forces involved in our circuit analysis. So in summary, the synchronous motor we are dealing with is the type 2. It starts off like an induction motor. We connect our resistors in series with our rotor windings so that our torque is generated on the rotor to start it rotating. The additional on the shaft of the shaft where the rotor windings and the slip swings are, we have got an exciter. When we reach a preset speed, this one generates a current and the current flows producing poles in our rotor windings. Those poles will try to lock up with the rotating magnetic field of our stator windings. And when they are trying to lock up, they generate some torque. And that torque is what I referred to my earlier talking as fluctuating torque. Apart from the induction motor torque, when the magnetic poles are generated here, produced here, when the DC current flows, they'll also try to be to lock up with the stator winding poles. And that will create a fluctuating torque until the two will come and lock up. And when they lock up with the poles of the stator windings, the rotating magnetic field, then they move together as one. And then it runs like a synchronous motor, and by that time our resistors are off the circuitry, only the exciter, which is feeding a current in our rotor windings to produce the poles, which have locked with our stator windings, and it continues running as the synchronous motor. Now, as before, when it stops, we must have the resistors back in position so that they are ready for the next operation. Otherwise, there will be, there can be problems with the currents we talked about. And I think briefly that covers all we need to know. So for our drawing, this drawing, typically I've tried to make it as simple as possible. The stator windings, the rotor windings, the slip rings, the exciter, and the starting resistors. Well, for the compact starter, you have got the drawing already. It's a question of just marrying the two together. And that finishes our uh, induction motor, the synchronous motor being the last one. And as I said in the neck, you can be asked to reproduce the drawings. And once you know the theory, the way I have explained it, it can be make it easier for you to reproduce that drawing. As I said earlier, engineering, try to understand the basics behind it. Don't try to memorize. You can overload your brain and you know when you overload it, what can happen. So if you understand it, reproducing it will be easier. So after that, we can move on to the other starting type of motors, which I'll briefly deal with one of the DC type before we look at the practicals on the starter circuits.
Now, we have nearly finished with the AC motors, the three phase. Then we'd like to talk something about uh, the starting of large DC shunt motors. Now, of course, uh, the shunt motors are the ones which may be prob problematic. The series ones, you know that the windings is connected in series with your armature, so they may not pose a, pose a big problem. And then with this one here is a method known as the faceplate starter. The DC here is, well, it's not for the former DC commission, it's for direct current. So when we have used DC to mean direct current faceplate starter for a shunt motor. Now, the drawing is more or less self-explanatory. We have got the handle which is spling rolled, the one which is moving along. And then we have got a stopper here. When it is the handle is not uh, attracted by the no voltage release coil here, it moves and this stopper here will hold it in position. And the spring will make sure it is resting on our stopper. And apart from releasing it, making sure the spring is resting, the arm is resting on our stopper, the spring is also intended to pull it back in case the no, there is no current in the circuit when the motor is running. So the spring, the return spring plays two major roles. Then we have got an overload release here. Now this one here is when you connect a circuit and in case there is an excess of current, this winding here will attract this arm here and this arm here will short these two points here. And as you, if you trace these two points here, these two points here are connected across the no voltage release coil here. Remember, when we started talking about motors, we said for AC, we, inter we interrupt the current flowing down into our contactor. But for DC circuits, we simply short the holding on coil of the circuitry. So this is the one which will be holding on our arm when the motor is running. So when there is an overload, our overload device here will simply short these ones here. And then when this one loses its magnetism, the spring will pull it back. So the mechanism of overload protection, in this case here, we are shorting the hold-on contact. For the AC, you are interrupting the circuitry of the hold-on coil. Major differences between the two. Now, and then the no voltage release, when it's running, there's no current, the mag loose magnetism, the spring will pull it back to the zero position. And then we have got the field and the armature connected in parallel, is a shunt motor, they're kind of in parallel. And then series resistors to reduce our starting current again in the armature. When it's starting these motors, they've got values of resistances less than one ohm in most cases. And then, so the resistances are the ones used to reduce that current. And the brass starts connections for the various resistances into the circuitry. Now, when you want to start your motor, you simply, after switching on your power supply here, you move your handle to the start position. Now, this one here, maybe refer it to the start position. Now, when your handle moves on to the start position, our current flows from one end of our direct current DC supply through the overload release and comes and joins this arm at this point here. Now, the arm itself is conducting, or there is a strip which is fixed on the inside up to this point here, this stud here, and this stud here engages with that one. Now, this thing here is mechanically connected to the arm, but is, we make sure that it's not attached to the conducting portion. So when you move your arm to the start position, the current will flow through the overload release, through the arm, through the start point here, and then move through the resistors, which are in series with our armature. So these resistors control the amount of current which is flowing in the Amateur. We can also see that at that point there, at the start, the current loss of flow through the 
no volt release coil and come and go through the field windings and back to the other end of our power supply. So when we are starting, the whole of the supply voltage is availed across our field and only a portion is availed to our armature. So these resistances, there will be a current flowing, there is a voltage drop across this one here, so the voltage available here is very small, so the current is also small. Applying Ohm's law into that circuitry. The armature resistance and this resistance is in series ensures the current flowing through here is small. Then after some time, now this arm, as you move it along, is also mechanically interlocked. In other words, you cannot move it from the start and then through these other positions. Maybe you can number them. One, two, three, four. The last one is the run. It's such that you cannot move it at once up to the run position. You move it to the start position, your armature will start rotating. And once it starts rotating, there is the generation of the back EMF. I think we are familiar with that uh, circuitry. And then when the back EMF comes to place, then you are able to move it from the start to position number one. Now when you are in position number one, you can see that we have removed one resistor which was in series with our armature. So now there is less resistance in series with the armature. Now the back EMF which is generated here is helping us to reduce the voltage. And at the same time, we can see that this resistor here is connected in series with our field winding. And then, after the, again, the back EMF generated at this new position here. When it reaches a particular point, it will enable us to move into position number two. Position number two, again, we have got less resistances in series with the armature. A higher EMF is being generated. And then, we'll be having two resistors which are connected in series with the field winding. So as we move along, we can see we are reducing the number of resistors which are in series with our armature and we are increasing the number of resistors which are in series with our field. So kind of now, the current in the field is reducing. And then we continue that process until we reach the run position. At the run position, now the voltage here will entirely be, because now the arm will be somewhere here. Oops. Somewhere here. And when it is in that position, this uh, no volt release will hold it in place. like that in the run position, then we can see that in the run position, the whole of the voltage will be across the armature, and then all these resistors will be in series with our field winding. So the resistors as move along, we are increasing them in series with our field winding, and we are reducing them in series with the armature. And then at this point here, this armature cannot uh, be destroyed, although it has got a small resistance, by virtue of the back EMF which is generated here, is taking care of the excess current that might flow. Now, the no volt release is the one which will hold a spring-loaded handle in that position. It also plays a role. Now, in case there is a power failure or somebody interacts with the circuits, then this one will lose its magnetism and the arm will be put back to the stop position. In the other case, when it is running in the run position and there is a problem, we have an excess of current flowing the, to the circuitry, then the overall release, a higher current will flow here, more magnetism will be produced and this arm which is weighted will be lifted up it will short these two contacts here. And when these two are shorted, this coil here will be shorted. It will lose its magnetism and the arm will move back to the stop position. Now, how do we prevent the restarting of the motor again? In case there was a power failure and the power came back, 
That one is simply because the arm is spring loaded, is held in the off position, somebody has to move it to start your motor again. So the high recommendations for motors is achieved. The spring ensures in case of power coming back, it will be held in position until somebody comes and moves the arm to restart the process again. So the key things to remember to know is the overall release. When there is excess current flowing into the circuitry, this one will lift this arm here, short those currents here, short these ones here, magnetism will be lost, that arm will move back to the stop position. This one holds our arm in the run position. In case of, power, of a power failure, it will lose its magnetism and the arm will be pulled by the spring back to the stop position. And I think in a brief, that explains the starting of our large DC shunt motors. Remember, the starting problem is caused by the low resistance in our armature, which you have to protect. Once the motor starts running, there's a back EMF which is produced and it takes care of the voltages that might cause some damage to our windings. And I think with that one, we finish the case of our motors. Unless, uh, otherwise. Now, this one is in the next syllabus. You can be asked to reproduce it. And I think if you understand the explanation I've gone through, it will be easier for you to reproduce in that when we are starting, we connect the resistors in series with the armature to protect it, and the whole voltage is connected across the field winding. As we start, we simply reduce the resistances in series with our armature and connect them in series with our field winding. So we know that when the motor is running, eventually, the field winding will be taking a smaller current than when it is started, because now all these resistors will be in series with our field winding, and none in series with our armature, the back EMF is on to take care of the voltages. Then we have got the overload release in case of excess current flowing in the circuitry here. This one will simply short the hold on coil. Well, this one can be termed also as a holding on coil for our arm for the motor to run. So overload, excess current, this one is set such that when there is an excess at a particular amount, it will be able to lift this arm here, which will short these two points here, shorting that one. This one losing its magnetism, the spring will pull it back to the off position. And then this one here, in case there is a power failure, it releases our spring, so that in case power comes back, the motor cannot restart. Because you can see if the arm will be in this position here, and the power comes back, it can restart. But then we have problems because at that point there we said we are connecting the whole voltage across our armature. So make sure when there's a power failure, no voltage release, this coil here will lose its magnetism and the arm moves back to the off position until the process can be restarted again. As I said, with series motors, we don't seem to have much problem. This shunt motors is where the biggest problem is, can be experienced. And that kind of a starter can take care of it. Now there can be variations of these ones here. This one I've drawn it here to explain the basic principle of operation and see how our I regulations are taken care of. Now, I think we have cleared the, the circuitry that I would like you to know for AC motors as well as the DC motors. Now, for the AC, we have got also single phase motors. And also for the three phase circuitry, we can also maybe control 
power control of the circuit. The power being supplied to the motors or to various equipment can be controlled. Now, the thing of his motors, I think uh, I'll leave you to read and make some uh, notes about it. Usually they are considered uh, self-explanatory. Once you do your circuit theory, on the theory of those single-phase motors, I think it can be easier for you to draw the circuitry. The only thing I want to mention here is, suppose you want to control the power supply supplied to those motors. Now, the amount of power delivered to a load can be controlled by using a silicon-controlled rectifier, of which if you did the symbols uh, assignment, you know the symbol for that one, or a triac. Now, there are various methods which are in use. Now, first one can be what we call the phase control. And this one is done by controlling the time for which the supply current is allowed to flow in the load per cycle of the mains current. Now, the cycle of the AC, I think you're already familiar with. Now, if you are using an SCR, silicon controlled rectifier, SCR, silicon controlled rectifier. We know it kind of rectifies and only one set of alternations in a full wave, only one half of the alternation will be utilized. So when you're using an SCR, you can control uh, the time for which current is allowed to, pro to flow per cycle. It's allowed to flow in the load per cycle. When you use a single one SCR, it means we are utilizing half of the cycle. In the rest here, there is no power supply. And then on this half alternation here, we can start, we can determine why we want the power to start flowing. So in this case here, the power, or rather the current in the circuitry, will be allowed to flow during that time. If that is angle, angle theta there, we've got pi and the to pi. So this is uh, on time and for the rest of the period, this one here and this one here, there is no power flowing into the circuitry. Mathematics, you can calculate the average current flowing between that point and that point here. And then the same case will apply at this point here. So this here is also off, and this one here is also off. So from theta to pi, angle is controlled by the SCR, something like that. And then, if you want more power, you can utilize some two SCRs, or you go for the triac. Now, when you have the two SCRs or the triac, if you have the triac and the two SCRs, you can utilize the both, the both alternations. And in this case here, maybe this one we switch it at the angle theta. We switch it on at that point there, theta. And this one here, we also switch it on at that point there, theta. So here, at this point here, there will be power supplied. And this one here, that one there is off, and this one here is off, this is on, and this one here is on. The shaded portion is when the power is allowed to flow in the circuit. Now this is the phase control. We can control from zero to theta when we don't want any current to flow in the circuit, then from theta through pi it flows from pi to 2 pi, no current, and then the sequence starts all over again. If one more power, we can use the triac, or you have two 
SCR so that we utilize the both alternations and here we can get more power. So the theta angle here we can control it and you can control it from zero up to maybe around the pi depending on the power that we want. So you as a designer you choose the circuit which you want to utilize. So that is the phase control per cycle when we want that cycle power to be connected to the circuitry. Now the other method is integral cycling or burst firing. Now this is done by allowing the power supply to flow in the load for an integral number of cycles in each given time interval. So in this one here, again, is a timer, timing circuits here. So maybe we want now the current to flow so many cycles for that amount of time. And then for the next period, this is time, maybe call it T on. Then maybe you can have a T off, time off from that point. And the off, again, you can decide how many, how many cycles you want it to be on. Of course, good practice, the T on must be the same and the T off the same. So one, two, three. So here you can have, again, one, two, three. So the T on from there to there. Power is applied. T off from that point. That point there is the time off. And for this one, we can come to other times known as the duty, duty cycle, which is time on divided by time on plus time off and some more arithmetic. So we can control through circuitry the time we want so many cycles for a particular amount of time. We switch off the power supply and then the same number of T on, the same as here, and we go on and on and on. So these are the two methods normally used when you want to control power supplied to circuitry. Now in the three phase, we can have three phase rectifier switching to control the power again supplied to the motor. Or in this case, I wanted to do something about the uh, single phase motors, which of late, I think NEC has been putting in exams so you are not caught in unawares. I think the assumption is if you're able to handle three phase motors, you should be able to also to handle the single phase motors. So I'll be giving you some few circuitry concerning single phase uh, power sub controlling of power supplied to single phase motors. But I think the two methods are clear. As a student of engineering, I think everything's familiar. The basics, you are familiar with them. I need not go into them. So I leave you with some circuitry which you can uh, think about how they will operate and then read more on the single phase motors and also of the three phase motors. I think the reference I gave you should be adequate uh, for you. So with a single phase motors, we can use the first one is single phase motor control utilizing half alternations. Of course, these alternations, I'm assuming the full wave, like that. This is the assume that one is the positive alternation. And this one here, the negative alternation. When you use an SCR, as I mentioned earlier, you can only use one alternation. So in this case here, we have got an RC network here. The RC network here will depend, will set the time for this SCR to fire. And in this case here, we are having the, sec the first method of control, which is the phase control method of controlling 
the power. So RC will determine at what angle our SCR fires. And in this case, only one alternation is being utilized. So the power is bound to be less. Resistor, variable one, to vary the firing angle. And then your single phase motor. Once it's switched on, it can run. And the rest of the theory, I think you are familiar with, familiar with it. This one utilizing one SCR. Now we can utilize the SCR, two of them, so that utilize both the positive and the negative alternations. So here we have got an SCR, sorry, we have got a trigger circuit here to trigger the SCRs, the two SCRs here, the motor and our AC. So the trigger circuits here will determine when the current is moving in this direction here, this one to conduct, when change the direction, the other one to conduct. So we utilize both the positive and the negative, only that we are able to control the angle in which the circuit is firing. This one we get more power and easier controlling mechanism. The circuitry here is electronics, RC combination circuitry, which I think you are familiar with. Of course, this one here is a finer controller compared to that one. And we also get more torque since there is more power being being supplied in your to your single phase motor. And then the other one we can use the track control, more or less similar to having the two SCRs together. Again, we utilize an RC network. The diac here is normally assist in the firing of our triac. And then utilizing the two alternation the two alternations and you get more power for your single phase motor control. So those three methods can be utilized to control the speed of your single phase motors and the neck are usually fond of asking questions on these ones. So that is electronics RC networks you have done, that one is also electronics, and this one you have also electronics. You can do it, you can determine the angle theta for your firing, firing angle. If you know the RC networks. And with that I think we finished what I wanted to say about motors. I think the circuitry here, the doing here a bit simple. No need to spend a lot of time on them, just peruse them. Maybe do some reading, find what kind of a network is this one here, how it is to fire both RC1, RC2 are different alternations. And that finishes my talk on the motor connection circuits. Now in our next lesson, one or two, we shall have a look at the accessories and do one or two circuits so that you are familiar, so that you don't just get the theory, you also get some practicals. Also, NEC expects you to know the theory as well as the practicals. And as I told you earlier on, going out looking for jobs when you finish, most companies nowadays, they look for the practical bit of it. You may be given simple circuit like this one, you are taught to assemble. Otherwise, today, most people, they seem to know the theory, but when it comes to the hands-on, there's a slight problem. So, we'll do one or two lessons on the motor connections circuits, at least so that you are familiar with the accessories and also how it can be done. And then, once we finish that one, we'll be going over to the domestic installations, briefly talk about those circuits.